Our scripture tonight is the most familiar and beloved psalm, certainly, in our country. Psalm 23 is one that many, many, many people have committed to memory. And because the place that we hear Psalm 23 most often is a memorial service or a funeral service, we have a tendency to look at Psalm 23 as a grief psalm, and it absolutely is not. Psalm 23 is a psalm of hope. In a memorial service or a funeral service, Psalm 23 is not for the one who died. It's for those of us who are still here. It's for those of us who need, to, need help getting through the dark valley. So I would ask you, as Psalm 23 is read, to listen to it as if for the first time. Listen for the word of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. What do you expect from the church? The church is called to comfort us in times of need. And the church is called to challenge us the rest of the time. So what is comforting and what is challenging? It really depends on your perspective and your expectations. Last Saturday, we had a memorial service in this chapel. A couple of months before that, a woman had called me to tell me that her husband was in hospice. And she wondered if it would be possible to have a memorial service for him in this chapel upon his death. She explained to me that she's actually a member of the church, but hasn't attended for a long, long time, and her husband had never been a member. Well, I assured her that that didn't matter. The membership didn't matter at all. But she went on to explain to me that they moved to another part of the county, never really found another church, and she stayed on the membership rolls through her giving, which I thought was sweet. So I said, are you in need of any pastoral care? I can come see you. And she said, no, we're really not. We have enough family and friends and hospice people around that that's fine, but I'm, I'll call and let you know when he passes. So a couple weeks ago, she called me and let me know what had happened. He had died, and she set up an appointment with me to come in and talk about his service. So she came in, and we sat down in my office, and it's the first time I'd met her face to face. She started telling me a little bit about herself and her husband. And she told me that she was delighted that they could have the service in this chapel because about 28 years ago, they'd been married here. So I was thinking. I said, how long has it been since you've been in the chapel? And she said, oh, it's been a while. And I said, well, how about if we gather up the stuff we need to plan his service and go up to the chapel and do it up there? Oh, yeah, she liked that idea. So we gathered up our stuff and we came up here. The lights were out, the, the blinds were drawn. So as we walked in, I went back and I turned on the lights and I opened the blinds to where they are now. It was a beautiful, sunny day. The first thing she did as she walked into this space was she did this, she went, I mean, this space has a unique scent. It does, it really, really does. And I don't know if it's um, the age of the building, I don't know if it's all the wood, I don't know if it's the cleaning supplies, but I mean, I was a member here since 1996. This space has a unique odor. It does. It's not bad at all. It's just I've had people walk through this space with me and sit for the first time and say, this smells just like the little country church I grew up in. Really. And so I got a kick out of that. That was the first thing she did. She just took in a big whiff of this space. She walked right up that aisle and out into the narthex and looked at that picture of Jesus knocking at the door, and she said, I think this has been here forever. And then she walked out onto the porch. Now, Walmart wasn't around the last time she was here, but it didn't seem to bother her a bit. She just stand, she stood there out on the porch and she looked around. She looked toward the cemetery, she looked around, and she started talking about the day she got married. It was in November. 
And when they got here, it was raining. And by the time they left, there was snow on the ground. You know, the memories were just filling her head. And what was familiar about this space was comforting to her. So we came back into the space, and we sat down in this front pew. And when I plan a memorial or funeral service with anyone, I have an outline that we follow. It's a Methodist service. And we can add things or take them away. But there's places to plug in Old Testament, New Testament lessons. There's places to plug in hymns. Some people come in and they know exactly what they want. Not very many, but some do. Some people come in and they have an idea of what they want, and so we look for that together. Some people come in and they have no idea what they want. They say, you do it. And, and still, I have them sit here while we figure it out. But no matter how familiar or not they are with the church, how familiar or they are or not with, with hymns or with scripture, what I find is in general what people are looking for is something familiar. Because what is familiar comforts us. So in this outline we use, we get to a place where you can choose to have Psalm 23 or not. Most people choose to have Psalm 23. In the outline, I have two versions. There's the King James Version that we heard, that is the one we're all familiar with. And then there, I, I have the New Revised Standard Version. That's the Bible we use in this church mostly. That's the one in the pew back. As a rule, if people want... Psalm 23, they want the King James Version, even though we don't use King James for anything else. And the reason is, it's familiar. It's familiar, and because it's familiar, it's comforting. Funeral and memorial services in the church are meant to be a time of comfort. I am absolutely convinced of that. Not only for those who have been in the church, but for someone who comes for one of those services, and this is the first time they set foot in a church, when they leave, I want them to know, I want them to feel grace, and I want them to feel love, whether they realize that's God or not. The church is absolutely called to comfort when we are in need, when we are in the midst of loss or grief. Comfort leads to healing, and healing leads to wholeness, and that's one of the things we're here for as the church. So if the familiar can lead to comfort, when would something like Psalm 23 not be comforting? When would something like Psalm 23 feel like a challenge and not be a comfort at all? Well, during the season of Lent, I had the opportunity to preach one weekend all four services, Saturday and the three on Sunday morning. I used the same sermon and the same scripture for all four services, but on Sunday morning, my scripture and my sermon had to fit within Pastor Greg's uh, sermon series that he was using. I believe even when. So it was the same scripture and the same sermon, but what was around it was different than Saturday night. And one of the things that was used during that series was in, in every one of those services, there was a responsive psalm. Responsive psalm would be the leader reads a, line, a verse, you read a verse back and forth. So I didn't choose my responsive psalm. It was chosen by the worship committee, and I was delighted to see that Psalm 23 was chosen. It worked, it worked beautifully with my sermon. So Sunday came and went. Monday came and went. Tuesday, I received an email. I received an email from a gentleman that I have met and I don't know very well. He told me in this email that he was so troubled Sunday by the use of Psalm 23 that he hardly heard the rest of the service. And on Tuesday, it was still agitating him, so he had to let me know how he felt. And I'm telling you, he was annoyed. Really, really annoyed. And that's putting it mildly. This is Psalm 23 from that, from that Sunday morning. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. Psalm 23 was not the problem. It was the translation that was the problem. This gentleman was absolutely convinced 
that Psalm 23, King James Version, is the right version, and any other translation was just simply wrong. We went back and forth with emails a couple times. I tried to explain to him that I understood, but in worship, there needs to be some challenge. And when we are as familiar as we are with something like the King James Version of Psalm 23, it can start to come off like sing-song. We stop paying attention to really what the words are. We might get a general sense of comfort from it, but we're never really looking at it from a fresh perspective. So if we use a different translation, it's just enough to get people's attention. And it might feel like a challenge, but it causes you to look at it from a fresh perspective. He would have none of that. <laughs> Absolutely none of that. He came right back at me with, you know, so anyway, I just, I let it go. I just let it go. We only use really highly respected translations in this church. You know, the New Revised Standard Version, uh, the NIV, the, National, the, the New International Version, and the Common English Bible are all translations by groups of scholars that have to come to consensus on what everything means. And so they are highly, highly respected versions, translations of the Bible. But, but for him, for him to hear that psalm in anything other than the King James Version was not only a challenge, it was offensive. It was wrong as far as he was concerned. It was wrong. And the challenge was not at all appreciated. So if the church is called to comfort us in times of need, and the church is called to challenge us the rest of the time, what do we do with that? See, I think that his pushback on that, it was a little extreme, but it's not that unusual. Um, it is with scripture within a worship service, but not in other areas. In the United Methodist Church, we understand that we are on a journey, a faith journey, and journey indicates movement. Movement toward God. This requires growing in, in our knowledge and looking at things from fresh perspectives and challenging ourselves. And we're not always comfortable doing that. Think about this. <clears throat> Imagine that you have a fifth grader in your life. Your child, your grandchild, a niece or nephew. And this fifth grader is finishing up fifth grade this year and comes to you and says, wow, fifth grade has been the greatest year ever. I absolutely love fifth grade. All my friends are in my class. And my teacher is so cool. And the stuff that we learned this year, I love it. I love it. And you know, sixth grade means changing to a middle school, and so my friends and I, we all decided we're going to stay in fifth grade. <laughs> we like each other. We like the teacher. We like our room. Hey, we know how lunch works and where the restrooms are. Why mess with a good thing? Can you imagine? This kid said, we're just going to keep learning pretty much the same thing over and over and over again until we are experts. Can you imagine? Well, first of all, it'd be illegal for them to do that. But, <laughs> but we truly expect our kids to take on the challenge of learning something new every single year. We expect them to step up and be in that next grade. And when they move from elementary school to middle school, that is a huge jump. When they move from middle school to high school, we're asking them to move out of a familiar space and into one that isn't with a lot of new people, and we fully expect them to be able to do this and do it well. But as adults, we get to a place where we don't always expect that of ourselves. We can sometimes, within the church, when the church is challenging us to learn and to grow and to move forward, we can, like that gentleman with his email, actually become offended by the idea of that. Because frankly, we've always done it this way. See, as a pastor, on Saturday nights, if you aren't at least occasionally challenged, I'm not doing my job. One of our senior pastors said, 
As a preacher, it's your job to step on toes, but don't make them bleed. <laughs> I love that. But if you don't leave here, at least on occasion, thinking, I haven't thought about it like that before. I haven't thought about the scripture like that before. That was weird, the way she talked about that. I mean, I don't know. What a strange story, and it sticks with you. If you aren't at least challenged on occasion to grow and, and move forward in your faith, then absolutely, I am not doing my job. And if you want to talk about comfort and challenge, then let's talk about faith and action. Faith and action happens next weekend. The big day is Sunday, a week from tomorrow. The people who oversee Faith in Action, the ministry leaders for that, look at the year before and improve it every year. Now, this is only our fourth year that we've done it. And every year they do their best to do something to make it better than the year before. So what they're doing this year, changing it up a little bit and challenging us somewhat, is they are challenging us to serve outside the comfort of the walls of this church and to serve outside the comfort of West County. And some will push back and say, there is need in West County. Yes, there is. And this one day in the entire year, we are being asked to go to one of our four core agencies or the neighborhoods around that and serve there. What's going to happen a week from Sunday, if you sign up, and I certainly hope that you will, what's going to happen is this. It's as easy as it can be. You sign up here. It's just your name, your phone number, your email address. If you don't have an email, no problem. They'll call you. You can indicate uh, the kind of work you're able to do. Nobody's going to ask you to do anything beyond your physical capabilities. You fill this out. You turn it in tonight. We give you one of these cool blue shirts, if you don't already have one. You will get called or emailed this week to let you know exactly where you're going to be serving and what bus you get on will be evident. A week from tomorrow, we show up just a little before 8 o'clock and we get on buses with other people in blue shirts, people from the church that we know, people from our church we've never met, visitors to our church we've never met, and we're going to go to these places and serve in these areas with all our new friends and our old friends, and then at noon, the time's going to go by like that. At noon, we get back on the bus. Within a half an hour, we're back to the church. And the United Methodist men know we're going to be hungry for lunch. So they are going to have lunch ready for us. Hot dogs and brats and hamburgers and sides. And we are going to, it's going to become as you are. We're going to paint and sweat all over us, and it's okay. We're going to grab a plate. We're going to fill it up. We're going to sit down and just share with one another what we did. And if when you get back at 1230, you need to get going, you can do that too. And you got the whole day ahead of you. It could not be simpler. The church is called to comfort us in times of need. The church is called to challenge us the rest of the time. The church is challenging us to go out and be the church to comfort those in need. And it's being made so simple for us. I promise you, you sign up for this and you do this, you're going to be taking a little quantum leap on that faith journey. And I heartily encourage you, I challenge you, to be here a week from Sunday in the parking lot, and get on a bus with me, and let's go make a difference for Christ in the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.